for most of us, the 1st of January doesn't only mark the beginning of the new year, but also it marks the day that we start implementing our New Year's resolutions to become healthier, more beautiful, and wiser version of ourselves. So this time, this year, we will call our parents more often, we will go to the gym daily, and uh, we will lead a healthy lifestyle. Unfortunately, research shows that despite all the determination and the confidence before the New Year's that this is all going to happen, only 8% of people actually follow through with their New Year's resolution. So for the rest of us, what's happening is that they're, by March they're long forgotten or delayed for the next year. And maybe the treadmill that we bought to exercise daily at, our, uh, at home has become a place where we dump and pile up our clothes and uh, books. So I'm not talking about this to make us feel like failures. I'm talking about this to draw the point that changing one's behaviors, attitudes, and ideas is not easy. It doesn't happen overnight, and sometimes it doesn't happen however much we want it and however much we need it. So as an immunologist, I ask myself the question, can we use the approaches, philosophies that we use in immune research uh, and take those approaches and maybe use them as a model to break this resistance to change for the better. So I will start off by talking about my own, a little bit of, about my own story with immunology, what immunology is, and then we'll dive right into the topic. So when I was 17 years of age, I received a scholarship to study in the United States. I wanted to study genetics, but genetics was not one of the courses offered by the scholarship. So I said, okay, I will study biology instead, and once I'm done with my undergraduate studies, I will go on and uh, continue my studies on genetics. So to show and internalize my commitments, I even got a double helix tattoo on my ankle. So I was all ready to be this cool uh, genetics researcher in the future, so I could see myself. But as things often are, not being able to study genetics uh, as an undergraduate was a blessing in disguise for me because I found my true scientific love in my fourth year of undergraduate study, which is not hard to guess, immunology. So what is immunology? Immunology is the study of the immune system, which protects our bodies and fights off disease-causing microorganisms. So I draw an analogy between the army of a country, which prevents invasion by foreign forces, and the immune system of our body, which prevents invasion by microbes, uh, that can cause disease and death. So all the systems of the body are amazing on their own right, but I think in my not so objective view, the immune system is the coolest one. Think about it. It's the only system in the body we can actually design a PlayStation game based on how it's working, like first-person strategy, or first-person shooter or strategy. So you have your killer cells, you have your foot soldiers, you have your special agents, snipers. So the immune system is very cool. So uh, going back to our analogy between the army and the immune system, uh, just as the soldiers of an army need to know who belongs to their own side and who is the enemy, the immune system, the cells of the immune system, needs to know which are the cells of our own body and protect them, not attack them, and attack only those cells that are free. So in immunology, we call this self, and non-self discrimination. Self is your own body cells, the immune system should not touch them. Non-self is the foreign uh, organisms that the immune system needs to use its power against. So uh, when the immune system, in the cases that it cannot make this self and non-self uh, distinction and turns back onto itself, autoimmune diseases develop. So a typical example would be type 1 diabetes, where the immune cells, they start attacking the body's own healthy cells that are producing the hormone that lowers the blood sugar levels. Okay? So it is very important for the cells of the immune system to be able to tell what is their own and what's belong to the outside. So to ensure this, the cells of the immune system, they receive literally training in two structures in the body, in the bone marrow and thymus, and they're then thought which is their own and which is not. So basically, when you get a flu, which is caused by a foreign microorganism, 
uh, is foreign, so it's non-self, what is the immune system going to do? It's going to attack it. So it's going to attack the flu causing microorganism and produce some of the symptoms that are uh, associated with flu. Okay. So you definitely know when you have a flu because your immune system is responding to it. Even though there is no scientific evidence, uh, the experience shows that these symptoms might be more pronounced in males. Right. So, uh, on one hand, we have immune system attacking to the flu, producing the symptoms. So, unfortunately, most of us have heard stories or know loved ones who have tumor in their bodies, but they don't become aware of it until very late stages, uh, until the cancer has spread. So, there is a question. You have your immune system attacking the flu-causing microorganism, and why is it failing to attack the cancer cells? The answer lies in self-non-self -self discrimination. Flu-causing microorganism is non-self, whereas uh, uh, cancer cells are the modified version of your own cells. So the immune system is trained not to recognize them. Okay. So here, we call this self-tolerance. So even though it's harmful to our body, uh, still, the immune system is not being able to attack it. So in this case, this self-tolerance is working against our benefits. So then, I thought to myself, can we use this model of self-tolerance in the immune system, where there is the harmful cells, but the immune system is powerful, powerless against it because it's their own cells, to understand why is it so hard to change our own views, beliefs, and attitudes in life. So I draw an analogy between the immune system's lack of power against itself when, it's, uh, uh, when the cells, even though they're harmful, they cannot attack it, and the psychological resistance we have to correct our mistaken or uh, outdated beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors. So just as the immune system uh, lacks the power to attack the cell, there's a psychological barrier against change. So in the beginning of the talk, I give the, quest, I give the example of New Year's resolution. And you can argue to me that it's just, you know, uh, it's not, there's no resistance. It's because you didn't really want it. If you were motivated enough, if you really wanted it, the change could have been easy. So to be able to understand whether it's about motivation or not, let's look at the extreme scenario. So let's look at the scenarios where making the change in daily habits is going to draw the line between life and death. So Robert Kagan, who is a renowned uh, developmental psychologist, talks about the cases where the doctors instruct their patients that only way to avoid death is to change their daily habits. So all of these people, they want to live, they want to continue on their lives, they want to uh, spend more time with their loved ones. So they have enough motivation. But only 14% of them could actually change their daily habits. So this underscores the point that sometimes, no matter how, how much we're motivated, their internal intrinsic resistance in our psychology against change. So as a student of biology for a long time, I know that any system, any process, mechanism that we have in our body is for, uh, for a beneficial cause, right? So in the immune system, it's not about attacking the cell to prevent autoimmune diseases, but it has a side effect of sparing the cancer cells as well. So I asked the question whether uh, this psychological self-tolerance against changing one's own views and uh, attitudes, is it beneficial? And definitely it is because uh, when you have this resistance, you have a firm ground to base your behaviors. Basically, you know who you are, you know what your ideas are, you know what you like, you know what you don't like. So it gives you a firm base to base your opinions that every morning when you get up, you know who you are. But just as, uh, as self-tolerance can work against immunology, uh, this self-tolerance in psychology, can there, there can be cases that it works against ourselves. So Robert Kagan and Lisa Lasko Lahe uh, coined the term immune to, to change, where they say that, okay, this resistance to change in our psychology is good on one hand because it gives us strength 
and stability in our lives. So we know who we are, we know what we want in life. But on the other hand, it can threaten our health by making us reject new information that will carry us to better realms, that will enable us to change our maybe harmful, mistaken beliefs, attitudes, and ideas. So the question arises, is it possible to break those two types of self-tolerance that I talked about? Namely, self-tolerance in the immune system, uh, where, you cannot, where the immune cells cannot attack the cancer cells, and the self-tolerance in psychology, where we have this resistance against change. So the answer to that is likely yes. So as far as psychology goes, as a, a topic of today's te TEDx uh, conference uh, so rightly puts forward, we now know that the brain is not immutable. So the brain is not a structure that gets uh, settled within like two years of your life and it doesn't change. Now we know that it is it, there is neural plasticity and there is potential, there is biological evidence that it is possible to reshape our views, attitudes, and psychology. So yes, we can cause a change. Uh, we can break the self-tolerance against changing our own views and ideas. As far as the immune system goes, we have relatively recently discovered that we have some uh, sort of rebellious immune cells that reject the training that they received and they can attack the cancer cells. Okay. So, uh, even though they're not really effective and they most of the time get suppressed, for us researchers it just opens a window where we can go in and manipulate those cells so that they can actually attack the cancer cells. So we can actually tap into the potential of the immune cells for clearing the cancer cells. To this end, there are, two, there are many approaches that we take to actually harness the power of the immune system against the cancer. And right now, many brilliant scientists all around the world, they're spending hours and a lot of money to actually find ways to retrain the immune system so that it can recognize the cancer cells and so that it can uh, clear them. Two of the approaches that we're using are increasing the immune recognition. So basically, we're trying to uh, make the immune cells recognize the cancer as harmful, even though it's a cell cell. Okay. And the other one is the use of chemicals called adjuvants, which I like to call like the energy drain of the immune cells. So basically, it makes the immune cells more ready to attack. So it just uh, lowers their activation threshold. So. The question arises, can we draw inferences from these approaches to actually, uh, can we draw inferences and model them to break the resistance in our psychology against changing our attitudes and beliefs? So the first one was increasing the recognition. So knowing that there's the harmful self. So can there be ways in psychology that will make it easier for us to recognize our harmful beliefs or mistaken beliefs, attitudes, and habits. Okay. And so that we just recognize that there is need to change. Okay. And recognition is very important just because in one of the models that uh, talks about the stages that needs to be passed to uh, bring about psychological change, change in habits, transferable model, which is posed by uh, Dick Robert and Prochaska, is that it tells us the steps that we need to go to give, uh, to uh, bring about change. And the first step is where the person is not aware that there's a need to change. Everything is fine, there's nothing that needs to be changed. But if you want to go through with it, if you want to go to the next step, which is contemplation, the person recognizes that there is a need to change. So basically, to be able to pass from the first to the next one, the person needs to first recognize and understand that something needs to change. And what, one of the ways for uh, recognizing that there is a need to change in our psychology is self-focus. And self-focus can be defined as having an accurate view of yourself uh, for self-understanding. So many religious and philosophical traditions that actually uh, come out mindfulness, what they're trying to do is that they want us to be able to be aware of our mental and emotional content rather than ignoring or burying them. Okay? So I always liken this to 
uh, the antivirus system in the computer. So from time to time, our antivirus system in the computer, it scans the computer to actually find things that might be infected, that might be causing uh, uh, discordance with the rest of the system. So with the self-focus, with maybe contemplating a few minutes a day, writing and rewriting our focus in this time of, uh, in this uh, highly fast-paced lives, uh, will make it easier for us to see the discord discordance between our inner reality and the outer reality. It will help us to recognize that there are things that need to be changed. Okay? And change does not, usually doesn't happen without the intent of change. So that's our step one. So the next, the complementary approach that we talked about was adjuvants, which are again the compounds that they don't cause an immune response, so the immune cells don't care about them, but they just make the immune cells more active. So if they recognize the cancer cells, adjuvants help them to attack them easier. Okay, so they, they lower its activation threshold. So we, there are a lot of, this is my actually my area of research, and there's a lot of research that that's going on to find powerful adjuvants. So if you apply it to psychology, I think the psychological adjuvant would be our experiences that doesn't actually cause a change in our attitudes, behaviors, or ideas, but it makes it easier to implement self-change later on. So basically, I can give you an example, maybe you go to India for your first time, and you see that there's a different way of life, different uh, traditions, different views of the world. So it's not that you adopt, adopt that uh, view, but you will see that there is difference. The life is not lived only in one way. Okay? So in the, uh, it will make it easier for you to break the resistance. Okay? So the, I think the psychological adjuncts could be traveling to uh, different places, uh, talking with people, who are outside of our comfort zone that have opposing views to ourselves so that we can actually appreciate that there is no one way to uh, sense and live the life. And I, I want to conclude by just saying that I think there is a uh, need, hope, uh, potential and benefit in reshaping the self-tolerance both in our psychology and in the immune system. And I think by doing so, our lives could be healthier, happier, and more fulfilling. Thank you very much.